I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. This is the last sermon in the series that we have called our Reformation series. Our 10th opportunity to look. And, and why 10 sermons this year? Well, it is the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. Conveniently dated October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg. And we have been following a series of sermons to commemorate that historic event, but not so much as a historic event, but as an event where God was at work among his church and among his people. We first of all talked about how the Reformation was a reformation of righteousness. That is, how may we get to heaven? How may we get to heaven? And it is by the righteousness of Christ substituted by substituted for us and received by grace. And then we looked at the famous solas, the onlys of the Reformation, or the alones. We looked at grace alone, scripture alone, Christ alone, faith alone, as some of the doctrinal emphases of the Reformation. But for these last five weeks, we have been taking a look at soli deo gloria, that is, glory to God alone. We have talked about how glory to God alone was discussed in the Reformation, mostly as a reformation of worship. Worship was in an abominable state in the Reformation, and worship was transformed in the Reformation. And we dare say it needs to be done again, do we not? We then talked about soli deo gloria as something in the church, that the glory of God must be observed in the church. Then we talked about how the family must be guided by soli deo gloria, and then how we ought to extend the glory of God into all the world by what some might call a cultural mandate. But we near, merely believe that it is the lordship of Christ going into every area of life, whether it be religious per se, or civic, or cultural, or in any type of way, Christ is Lord. Abraham Kuyper said, there is not one thumb breadth of this world where God does, that Jesus does not say, it is mine. It is mine. The last thing I want us to talk about today is our hope for the future. As we looked at the Reformation, the Reformation was, in my opinion, not every Presbyterian theologian believes it, but in my opinion, it was not only a reformation, that is, a change in the structure of the church and fixing things that were broken, I also believe it was a revival. Now, we think of revival, those of us who grew up in churches, is those meetings that you have in October and April. We're going to have a revival. And there are certain methodologies, I'm afraid, uh, brought up by uh, formerly a Presbyterian named Charles Finney, who in the 1830s began to wrest the concept of revival away from what the Bible taught and began to make it a mechanical method by which we do these certain things, and God gives revival, and we need to gin this stuff up every once in a while. Revivalism was begun in the middle of the 19th century, and that's not what we're talking about. A revival is the work of God's Spirit, where He does the normal things He always does. He saves, He fills, He baptizes, He draws people to Himself, but in revival, he does it faster, wider, and deeper in such a way that stuns us and surprises us. We have been looking at the book of Acts, and I believe that Acts is a, an account of that first revival. That is, a revival of God's Spirit where the gospel went into all of the world. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, then to the other parts of the world. And it was God's Spirit poured out upon the church that created this amazing event. Now in the book of Acts that we have been studying, and in Sunday night now we're studying, we have seen the work of God's Spirit again and again. And in the book of Acts, there are certain things that come to our notice, is that every five years, according to Professor Wilbur Wallace, and I believe he's right, Every five years, there is a verse in the book of Acts that stops and says, okay, this is what's happened. It's a summary. It's a five-year cap. We see the first one in chapter 6, verse 7. It says, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, 
and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That occurred, in my opinion, around 35 A.D. If the book begins about 30, about, this is about 30. And then in chapter 9, we see another one. There are many. Chapter 16 has one, chapter 19, chapter 12, chapter 28. The whole book spans in five-year chunks all the way into 60 A.D. But the one that I have, I will admit to you, simply fallen in love with and has been a, a matter of prayer in my life and hope is the summary statement at year 30 or year 40 in chapter 9, verse 31. This is my hope for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope that the Holy Spirit might be among us and revive us and the church in the United States and the church all over the world so that we might see what we see described in this great summary verse in our lives as well. Hear God's word in Acts chapter 9, just one verse, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Five things. Oh, I'm not preaching tonight, so I'm going to have to get in a couple extra points. Five things that I want to display to you as a hope, a hope for the church, a prayer for reformation and revival to touch our hearts. I want it to be your prayer. I want it to be your longing. And I believe it ought to be. First thing is this, let God's people long for opportunity. Let God's people long for opportunity. I see that in verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, you, you notice that Luke is following that, that progression that he announced that the gospel was going to slowly start moving out in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Had peace. Now, where do I get opportunity out of peace? Well, peace, seemingly, by most commentators, they think that there was a moment, a blink, as the old Scots called it, where there was not persecution. That there was, after Paul was converted, this moment where suddenly they could rise up and look around and to see what was going on. It's possible. It's possible that he may be thinking about general political peace in the area. Somebody once said that the longest period of political peace in the Roman Empire was the time when Christ was born and came into ministry and the gospel was spread. That's an interesting point. It's some historians hold on to that. It could be internal peace. Finally, the church started, stopped quibbling with each other. Well, where do I see quibbling churches in chapter 1 through 9? I see quibbling churches in the word church. It's people. It's who we are, and we have a tendency to do that. Maybe the church itself had peace. But I think the point here is not just that there was peace in the church and peace in the valley and peace in the world, but I think that peace opened the door for the church to look at itself and look at its job, to look at what was going on out there. And often, peace does that to a church. You know, when we have people fighting among ourselves and church discipline taking place, heresy in the church, all kinds of things of that nature, when that takes place, it, we focus on that. We lock in on that. But when we take a deep breath and realize that God has blessed us and that the church has this moment where nothing is pushing in on us, what normally happens, I believe, is a church focuses not only on where they are, but what they need. That kind of took place in the early 60s and the late 50s in the United States. I believe that huge awakenings took place in the United States in the 1740s, the first great awakening. Then, in my opinion, 40 years of continued revival from 1790 to 1830 before Charles Finney and his ilk began to kill it off, so to speak. I believe that there was an incredible revival right before the Civil War called the Prayer Revival. Uh, we'll mention it again to you. But I also believe that in the 
in the 1960s, there was a, a beginning of what some of us who were alive to see was a Jesus revolution type revival that is still to some degree rippling in the United States that for about 10 years in the midst of some turmoil, but even before the Vietnam marches got going, there was this moment when people began realizing that there was something wrong with the church and something needed to be done. One historian said this, God is full of surprises. With my memory, within my memory, the American church of the 50s and 60s was stuck in a rut, getting stale, lacking a prophetic voice. And as the 60s progressed, our nation started tearing itself apart. What happened? God came down. And we saw and some of us lived through some of the effects of an incredible work of the Holy Spirit where he worked faster and deeper and wider than we would ever have seen and at times have yet to see since. Let me just ask you, do you long for that kind of opportunity? For the open door that peace gives you? For a moment to look and see what the world out there needs? We may have that in this church at this moment. We may have that in this nation at this moment. It may not last long. For some of the things that we believe that the word of God says are slowly but surely not becoming the norm in our nation. And things that we call sin are starting to be called something other than sin. And it is possible, it is possible that there might be a time when the state, the nation, the civil government rises up against the church. But it's not yet. But we need to pray that God continues to give us opportunity, that God continues to give us an open door, an opportunity for peace. We don't long for a time when the government will call us a hate group, but we long for a time when we might be able to share the gospel freely. That time is now. Do you long for that time to continue? The second thing I'd like to say about this passage is something I'd like you to long for. I, I wouldn't want God's people to long for strength. Do you long for strength in your church? Do you long for strength in your own heart? Look at our passage in verse 31. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up. This famous Greek word used frequently that talks about building up like a house being built up with bricks. And though we might look at our venerable building and say, we, we don't need any more buildings, I think we still need building up. We still need strength. We still need God to work in our hearts and to grow us up. And like a house that brick by brick, mortar by mortar, sheetrock by sheetrock, carpet, plumbing, step by step, we need to grow. There ought to be no time, no time, no time, no time in the life of a Christian where he is not longing to grow and to be built up in the context of the ordinary means of the church, whereby the preaching, teaching, praying, sharing of God's people as they come together builds us up. You see, that's what it takes. It, being, it means being built up by proper feeding. We need to feed ourselves the word of God. Do you long for a greater influence of the scripture in your life. In your life. Do you long for that? Do you long that you might get strengthened and grow? My best friend in high school who I've told you many stories about has a son who is out in Colorado now and he is a, a personal trainer. And if you ever would look at this man's blog, he's a man in his 30s now in his late 30s, and he does more physically in a week than most of us do in a year collectively. He is one of the most amazing physical specimens, and I met and ate lunch with him one time when he was touring with one of his productions, his, his running productions through Huntsville, and I, and, and I just decided to tell him about my workout. As I was telling him what I did, looking for tips from the master, young Scott Jones said to me, he said, all, all you got to remember, Randy, as he was smiling and trying not to criticize his older brother, he said, it's all about resistance. It's resistance. You fight the resistance of your body. You push, 
push further. That's all it is. Do all your little exercises you want with your little tiny barbells. Just remember, you got to get to push against resistance. Are you doing that? Are you pushing against the resistance that you have to pray? Are you pushing against the old man in you who wants to hold grudges? Are you pushing against your natural tendency to want to sleep till noon or watch television on Sunday morning? Are you pushing against not giving him the Lord's Day in its entirety? Are you pushing against those things that would make you just like the world, that would make you fit in with everybody else, but that will make you ineffective and plateauing as a Christian? Let me ask you, do you long to grow? Do you see in your life a greater element of discernment? Are you discerning? That's one of the, the signs of growth as a Christian, that the Word of God becomes such a part of you that you begin to be able to discern, make better choices in your life. Are you seeing the work of the Spirit and even sensing the work of the Spirit in a greater way in your life? Are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit in a greater way? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Are you finding delight in the ordinary things of the church? Are you finding delight in simply praying, simply reading the word, simply hearing it preached? Are you finding a greater delight in those things? That's what it means to grow. Check them off. How are you doing? Ask the Spirit to help you figure it out. The third thing is this. Let God's people long for fear. Let God's people long for fear. You see it there in chapter 9, don't you? Some people think this is an Old Testament concept. Yet just a few weeks ago, when we preached about the family, we said it was the key part of soli deo glory in the family. Let's look at it here in 931. They had peace, being built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord. Now, even that phrase, as simple as it is, is hard to discern. It's like peace. What, what exactly are they, are they talking about? It could just mean true religion. It's a phrase that the Bible uses for people who are simply living the Christian life. Maybe that's part of it. It could be people who are simply doing the right thing. Remember two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we told you that the fear of God is being more concerned about what God thinks than your friends think being more concerned, in a sense, fearing more God's opinion than the opinion of others and doing the right thing may be true. But in the Bible, this word does mean terror. It means terror. John Murray says, who should be afraid of God? Those who have a reason to be afraid of God. I've always loved that quote. Those who have a reason to be afraid of God. Those who are mired in sin and care not about righteousness. To those who are wicked. To those who turn their back on holiness. To those who are hardened in the ways against God. Yes, they should be afraid of God. But for the Christian, we talked about filial fear. That is fatherly fear. And we talk about the fatherly fear where we care what our father thinks and, and we're upset when our father is upset. That's the fear I think they were growing in. But they were also growing in a sense of awe and reverence. I've talked about it so many times from this pulpit. You're getting tired of me to talk about it, but I, I'm getting convinced. I'm getting convinced that the sense of reverence is disappearing from the evangelical church. It's disappearing from the evangelical church. One author said it this way, among all the recent changes in worship, nothing that will make congregations awestruck has been done. Yes, worship is joy, but joy rising out of the fear and the reverence that we have for the king in our presence. The king who's in our presence. In Revelation 15, just to show you that fear goes all the way to the end of the Bible, the great song of the angels. They sing the song of Moses, Revelation 15, 3. 
the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are all your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. In the revival called the Second Great Awakening, Dr. Noah Porter, a pastor, was describing the life of a community, not just a church, but a community in Farmington, Connecticut, during the work of Asahel Nettleton, all those early Second Great Awakening revival preachers. He says this, The state of feeling which at this time pervaded the town was interesting beyond description. There was no commotion, but a stillness in our very streets, a serenity in the aspect of the Christians, and a solemnity apparent in almost all, which forcibly impressed us with the conviction that in very deed, God was in this place. You could feel it. You could cut it with a knife. It's the fear of God. It's the hush of the very presence of the Spirit. It is the weeping of people coming close to God and dealing with their sins. It is the singing of the just. We see joy throughout the Scripture when describing worship, and it is almost every single time connected to singing. It is the work of God, so much so that we know that He is in this place. I told you years ago and repeated again and again, one of the most humbling and delightful and quieting thing that ever happened to me was in my little church of, of 40 people that we were just getting going. This man from Cincinnati, Ohio, isn't it amazing? We can remember these details, 1982, came in and we had our worship service. We were beginning to change our worship from a, shall we say, happy clappy worship to a worship where we were asking God to be among us in reverence. And this man from Ohio, who is an elder in a church, he wrote his name in our guest book. And then he wrote, Surely God is in this place. Do you long for it? Do you long for God? To be among us. Have you sensed it before? Yes, you have, haven't you? Yes, you have. Do you long for it to be at the First Baptist Church? The Methodist Church? All the Presbyterians? Do you long for God's people to have a sense of His presence that hushes our hearts and fills us with joy? The fourth thing is this. Let God's people long for the Spirit's work. For the Spirit's work. Notice it says in our passage, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Do you long for the, the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be among us? Well, what does all that mean? It's, it's another difficult passage, believe it or not. The Holy Spirit, we know who He is, the third person of the Godhead, the one who is dwelling among us, who brings us the very presence of Christ, who lifts us up in worship, who enables us to pray, who prays with us and for us, the one who has baptized us into the family of God, who is an earnest of our hearts so that we might know that God is among us and we are going to heaven when we die. And yet we also know that though at the very moment of our conversion we receive the work of the Spirit, we know that though we are filled with the Spirit, we sometimes grieve the Spirit. We sometimes quench the Spirit. We grieve the Spirit by relationship sins. We quench the Spirit by our attitudes towards sacred things. We sin against Him. And though we are filled, we leak. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit leaves us when we sin. I've actually read, I've actually read a theologian lately who says every time you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves. He comes back, he goes back, he comes back, he comes back, he comes back. Holy Spirit better have a key coming back in that door all the time. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave, but we can grieve Him. And here we see the comfort of the Holy Spirit is there. Now, yes, I think it means comfort, but this incredible word, paraklesis, paraclete, many of you know this Greek word. 
It's a word that can mean so many things. And in this case, might mean every one of those things. It can mean the exhortation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was teaching. The Holy Spirit was making the word alive in their lives. It is the encouragement of the Spirit. The, the Spirit was lifting people up. It could mean the correction of the Spirit. It could mean that the Spirit was, was convicting of sin. It is the instruction of the Spirit. But it can also mean, and is translated in nearly every New Testament, the comfort of the Spirit. And it probably does mean maybe all those, but it does my, mean also comfort. In this particular case, not just the comfort of they're there, it's a tough day, but you're going to be okay. Not just that. It is the comfort of the assurance of your salvation. It is the comfort of confidence in God's work in you. That though you've got far to go, that though you may feel like you're completely out of sorts, that God is still going to come and work in you. It is the comfort of the Holy Spirit that gives you peace, that gives you joy in the midst of even trial. It is the comfort of the Spirit that gives you, even as you sit down to worship, even as you sit down with your cup of coffee to open your Bible to pray in your quiet time, as you gather together in a small group with others to look at the Word of God, it is the comfort of the Spirit that gives you a sense of His presence. The comfort of the Spirit is not noisy. The comfort of the Spirit is not radical signs that we have seen in the book of Acts. The comfort of the Spirit is more of the Spirit's work in our lives. I've shared with you before and share with our praying men from time to time the old story that Martin Lloyd-Jones would tell about the Welsh church that had called a, a preacher to come and preach. And, and the time of the preaching had come. Maybe it was 6 o'clock at night. I don't know. And 6 o'clock at night, they were all together. The elders were there sitting in the front row in the Welsh church, and, and the preacher wasn't there. The preacher wasn't there. And so they said, well, where is he? Well, he was staying down at Mrs. Williams' house. Mrs. Williams is here. Where's the preacher? And they sent a little boy down. They said, little boy, go down there and, and go get the preacher and get him up here. So they went down to the preacher, and she began to, he, little boy began to look at the knock on the door, but he heard something, and he looked in the window, and he heard the man. He saw the man, and he heard him talking. And he thought he'd just better turn around and go back to the church. And he went back to the church, and the elders were gathered. And he said, well, where is he? And he said, he's talking to somebody. And they said, talking to somebody? What did you hear him say? And the preacher was saying, unless you go with me, I won't go. Unless you go with me, I won't go. And he was talking to the Holy Spirit. Unless you go with me. Unless you fill me with a movement in the heart that enables me to preach and teach the Word of God, I won't go. I won't go. Do you long for that? I'm not just talking about emotionality. I'm talking about a sense, a sure sense, a believing sense, sometimes by faith and not by feeling at all. That the Holy Spirit is with you. Do you long for the Spirit's work? And finally... We let God's people long for more people. Do you long for more people? Do you long for more people? Do you sit there and think, wait a minute, there's a spot in the pew in front of me. My neighbor could be sitting there. And why is he not sitting there? You know, you, you know there's somebody with my children at school. I always use the name Billy Bob. I, I'm hoping there's no William Robert here for me to talk to. I say, well, you know, Billy Bob's not in church today. Where is he? Acts chapter 9, verse 31 ends, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Spirit, it multiplied. Literally, maybe a better translation, but odd and probably not good, but literally, it got multiplied. It was, in a sense, people got saved. God added to their number, as it says in Acts chapter 2. You see, God has to do this. He gives us eyes to see. He enables the heart to respond. But though God is the one who saves and who adds to our number, it does not take away our responsibility to offer the gospel to all 
that we know. It is no coincidence that the people that you deal with on a daily, weekly basis are in your life. It is no coincidence that unbelievers are in the life of every believer here. It's no coincidence that the ones who are there are there in front of you as a Christian. Do you long for them to come to Christ? Do you long for them to be added to the number of God's people? Do you long for that? Are you happy with our little holy huddle? Are you happy with who's here? Are you happy with the X amount of millions of people who are in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why do you go to church? Well, I, I go to see my friends. I, 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 was so, I, I was so overwhelmed with my little children when I had them. They, they, would, they would die rather than miss church. And I said, oh, Holy Spirit called them to ministry. And I said, why would you rather die than not go to church? I've got to go see Kevin. I've got to go see Trevor. I've got to be with my buds. Yeah, I like to be with my buds too. But I'd like to see us with a movement in our heart that would make us long to come here and bring others with us. It could start small. In 1857, when I mentioned the prayer revival before the Civil War, Jeremiah Lamphier called a prayer meeting in the Fulton Street Reformed Church, a Dutch church, in downtown New York. He decided, I'm just going to get people to pray. The, the situation in the world was not good, in the United States was not good. You know your history, you know those dates. In 1857, he decided to just start a noon prayer meeting, just a noon prayer meeting. And he started this prayer meeting, and it began to grow. Oddly, oddly grow. Not like, oh, we had nine last week. No, it began to grow oddly. Within six months, 10,000 laymen were praying in the beginning of the noon hour for revival. And church experts have said that in that same period where there might be a thousand or two thousand or some added to the church in that period, two million. This is the Civil War. This is not today. Go back and look at the populations. Two million people came to Christ through the prayer revival that began in the Fulton Street Church in New York. Who longs for that to happen again? Maybe you don't long for it. <laughs> Maybe all this talk is, well, it's just unsettling. You know, we don't want to get to be like those other churches that are having. I, I'm not calling any meetings. You don't have revivals. God has revivals but we long for it. If you don't long for it, it may be because you don't care. All you care about maybe is your own self and your own experience and your own fulfillment. And you wish that I would preach more about how to make you happier, how to get you more comfortable in your own skin, how to live your life out there. And, and I'd like to think that some of what I'm saying has to do with that. But here's the issue. You'll never, you'll never get comfortable in your own skin. You'll never know how to be happy unless you deal with sin, the same sin that blinds you to what your heart must be longing for. Longing for a work of God in your own heart is the first step of revival. It's the first step. Today, if you hear the sense of the Holy Spirit calling you that your life needs to be changed, the lost need to be saved and you're one of them and you need what Acts 9 31 is talking about in your life you need to come to Christ right now right now if you hear his voice do not harden your heart but ask him to save you Christian we used to pray for revival more often in our church I don't know probably the preacher kind of slacked off a little bit it, it's always in our Wednesday night prayer sheet but I don't pray for it like I used to Maybe it took a 10th anniversary to get my eyes back where they need to be. We 
need to pray for. Some might say, wait, wait a minute, uh, my marriage is in trouble, and you're talking about some kind of church thing. I, I, I've got money problems. I'm depressed. I'm sad. I've got all kinds of weird things happening to me. Will you just tell me about that? Let me tell you this. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life in power, those things change. Just a foolish illustration. One time, I think I told you this one time, I tell all of my premarital counselees this time when it talks about marriage, one time I was, I told you some of this story, hold your breath, I was criticizing my wife's cooking one time, years ago. Sort of like criticizing Picasso, he's painting, well, uh, Picasso. <laughs> criticizing box music, anyway said something to her. And you know what she did? Not so much because of her confidence in her own cooking. Everyone, there's lots of good cooks here. But she looked up and said, you haven't had your quiet time today, have you? <laughs> when I meet with Jesus and walk with Jesus, the world is a different color. My relationships are different. When revival comes in a heart, in a church, it changes everything. In the tenth of these sermons about the Reformation, I wanted to remind you that God is not finished with us here yet. And I'm desperately praying that he's not finished with us here yet. Not only here, but in our presbytery, in our denomination in our state, in our city, that God will change once more our nation as he has before. Isaac Watts, in one of his, my favorite hymns, said it this way. Would you say it this way? We long to see your churches full, that all the chosen race may with one voice and heart and soul sing your Redeeming grace. A lesser known hymn writer whose hymns you will not find in any hymn book said it this way. God of eternity, Lord of the ages, Father and Spirit and Savior of men, yours is the glory of time's numbered pages. Yours is the power to revive us again. Pardon our sinfulness, God of all pity. Call to remembrance your mercies of old. Strengthen your church to abide as a city set on a hill for a light to your fold. Head of the church on earth, risen, ascended, yours is the honor that dwells in this place as you have blessed us through the years that have ended. Still lift upon us the light of your face as you have blessed us through years that have ended still lift upon us the light of your face. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we ask you that we would have peace, that we would be built up, that we would walk in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Spirit, and that you would multiply us, Father. We long to see our churches full. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.